Erath Winery is so very near and dear to the Four Top, and let me tell you why. Erath is offering a very super special, the Four Top six pack of wines, and that's exclusive to you, our Four Top listeners, at a very nice discounted price. Go to erath.com slash the four top to learn more and purchase those wines so you can taste along with us when we enjoy our next installment of our Oregon Pinot Noir education series later in this episode. So stay tuned for that. And now time for the show. Sparkling wine is, is the most versatile wine in the world. We always talk about how it is, right? It goes with anything. But what I like about it is like sparkling wine is still wine. True, true, true. Well, hello everyone and welcome to The Four Top. It's a roundtable discussion of today's hot button topics in the wine and food world. I am your host, Catherine Cole. I'm joined today by co-host Martin Reyes, a master of wine, winemaker, activist, and a lot of other things. Hello, Martin. What are you drinking tonight? Uh, hi, Catherine. You know, tonight I am drinking this Chilean producer. Uh, Antis is the name of the wine. It's, it's made by uh, William Fevre, based in Chile. And, you know, Chile doesn't really get much respect as much as, as it should sometimes these days, especially in, in our country. So I thought, why not start with something that's uh, often overlooked? Oh, well, I can't wait to hear more about this wine. I am sipping an Oregon natural wine from a producer uh, called Hayu. That's H-I-Y-U. The wine is called Crataegus, and it's been open for a week and a half, and it's still pretty good. Um, So I'm excited to continue sipping it. And on that note, this is going to be our down and dirty natural wine episode. And no topics are off the table. We're going to try to define the slippery term discuss the Cold War between natural and more conventional winemakers, and question the possible quackery of so-called clean wines. Our panelists today are Esther Mobley, the wine columnist at the San Francisco Chronicle. Hello, Esther. Nice to see you. Hey, great to be here. And Amanda Smeltz, a poet and also the wine director for two New York restaurants, Estella and Ultra Paradiso. Hello, Amanda. Thanks for joining us so late your time. You're very welcome. And are you two sipping anything this evening? (laughs) <laughs> I haven't opened anything yet. The <laughs> uh, last thing I drank was this fabulous bottle of Perrier sparkling water. So I'm, <laughs> um, but I do have a, a new Glarus spotted cow beer open that I'm about to enjoy, mm. which is a fun Midwestern brew that I used to drink when I was an undergrad. So that's what we're on tonight. Ah, that's a good good choice. Okay, well, let's let's kick off this discussion by, I'm sorry, everyone, I know we've all had to do this a million times, but for our listeners and to remind ourselves, um, can we define the term natural wine, which is actually not as straightforward a task as it might seem. Uh, Amanda, sorry to dump this one on you, but I'm guessing that you do get this question, question a lot from your customers, and I bet you have a really good quick and dirty definition. So can you start us off by just defining the term natural wine? Um the quick and dirty answer is no, I sure can't. Um, so my thing that I say about this is that there is that definition is not what people should be seeking when they are talking about natural wine or wine in general. Um, the reason for this is because of the sort of vast spectrum of viticultural and vinification techniques that are done across the world. Um, so the way that I would say it, and it is not simple or easy, it might be dirty, but the way that I would say it is, um, natural wine is wine that generally speaking is produced without the addition of a ton of chemical inputs or overly industrial inputs in the vineyard. So in the farming process, and also is produced once you get fruit into cellar, um, that's produced without a great deal of chemical or overly industrial mechanical inputs during that part of the process. So the reason I say generally speaking is because there are a bunch of variations along the way when we're talking about farming and we're talking about how something gets made that people can sort of quibble over and and argue about. But that's the really broad idea. And then when that broad idea doesn't work, I say it's the difference between a can of Budweiser and beer that was made in a French barn um, inside of an old barrel that nobody put anything inside of. I like that. (laughs) And Amanda, you're kind of known as someone who's a proponent of natural wine. So I'm curious, what do you love about it? Well, it's nebulous, but in natural wine and the the really good ones, and especially the great ones, and there are many, many of both of those, there is 
an expressive quality in natural wine and a um, sort of liveliness and even a sense of um, both freshness and vivacity and just kind of um, movement on the palate as well as in aromatics that I find sorely lacking in more conventional wine. Um, moreover, there's a ton more specificity and uniqueness in natural wine as opposed to the same um, flavor profile and style that you can get when you're drinking wines from one place and from sort of monolithic practices. So their uniqueness and their expressiveness are usually the things that I that I return to again and again. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd say one of the things that I understand a lot of people love about natural wine and what I appreciate about natural wine is that the lack of definition can actually be a freedom and it can be kind of open to interpretation and it's not subject to the kind of bureaucracy or uh, boundaries that sometimes, you know, other types of wine practices might be. I mean, you think about organic farming, for instance, where in the U.S. you can get a certification for that, but that comes with all kinds of financial barriers and then the questions of what actually are required of people who do that becomes kind of controversial. So, um, of course, we we can talk about what's happened in France recently as, as an example of something like that. But I think part of the beauty of natural wine is that it's it's just this kind of thing that people have to figure out on their own and that it's, it's, it, there's something more democratic about it because it lacks an official definition in most parts of the world. Mm-hmm. Doesn't it seem like uh, the wine industry has this penchant, this love of defining? I don't think it's just the wine industry. If you guys wanted to jump into the politics <laughs> of it right away, I'm happy to, but <laughs> it's, I think I, I, th- I think that there's an issue with desiring definition in just about everything we do, right? Like if you're at the grocery store, it's like, okay, I'm going to go get cheese. And you're like, well, what cheese? And it's like, if you're raised in the States and you're not from a lot of money, the answer is cheese, like just cheese. Cause that's all that's there, right? It's going to be craft American singles. And that's literally it, but that's how we define it. We're like, okay, well now that I've had cheese, that's cheese. And the moment that you're introduced to something that's not that you're like, okay, well, what is that? That's not cheese. Right. So there, there is like a narrowness of definition that we're accustomed to in many, many corners of our lives, I think. Well, I'd say it's also alcohol. So yeah. it gets regulated yeah. a lot more carefully and strictly yeah. than a lot of other things. And I would also say the fact that wine is is a bit esoteric, like there's there's just a, a slight barrier to entry to understanding it. Similar to cheese. Cheese is another example. Mm-hmm. That like mm-hmm. not not every single person kind of has an intuitive understanding of it. I think that invites a certain level of kind of um, hierarchy and stratification and definition, just as a way of kind of explaining things that sure, maybe call it something this and not that, was, that, and that's trying to make yeah, it easy. Yeah, yeah. And Esther, you did make reference to um, a, a new definition, I believe, that has cropped up in France. There's an organization called the Vin Vito de Latour, um, and their charter, I'm going to quote Eric Asimov here, the New York Times columnist, requires its members to use only grapes that have been certified organic and harvested by hand. They must be spontaneously fermented with yeast found naturally in vineyards and wine cellars and made without what the charter calls brutal technologies like reverse osmosis, thermovinification, or cross-flow filtration. We don't need to know what else all those terms mean, um, but it's a lot of fiddling in this in the cellar. Are are there specific like is there a, does the does the French definition address sulfur? I can't remember. I bet it doesn't. Too touchy. Demeter certification is 100, and I and I think that, that that's still on the outside edge of what a bunch of natural vineyard owned would be like, ooh, that's kind of a lot. But th- but that's for Demeter BioD certification. I'm sorry, biodynamic certification. So I'm going to back everyone up. Um, we're talking about sulfur. <laughs> <laughs> that got into inside baseball. Sorry. <laughs> sulfur dioxide we're referring to, which is, an, is a preservative that can be used to basically keep that wine shelf stable, um, but natural winemakers prefer to use very little, if any at all. And if you add too much, then the whether the winemaker or the customer, then they have to sulfur through it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, well, I would say even a so-called conventional winemaker would, would probably concede that too mm. much sulfur dioxide added to a wine kind of erases the character of a wine. Like even at a conventional winery, they're 
they're tracking how much sulfur they add because they kind of have an understanding that you don't want too much, that whatever the kind of liveliness of the wine is at a certain level of, of adding this preservative gets erased. So the question is how little can you get away with adding? Right. And, um, you know, some people think that a wine that is, has no sulfur added is vulnerable to all kinds of spoilage and, uh, bacterial problems. Some people say those problems are not problems at all. And they're beautiful, beautiful features of the wine. I, I was I was thinking, Amanda, you your definition of the of the term uh, I think is is, is brilliant, and, mm-hmm. and at the same time, it opens itself up to a wonderful dialogue around I think a question here that is like, can you define the spectrum, right? Where at what end of the spectrum do you do you cut off the definition? And of course, the whole point is the whole your whole point is that you 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 can't that it's a, is it then does it come down to like a a spirit or an intent? Um, and is, and then, and then is there like enough gray areas where like art on the one side, you've got something that's clearly art on the other side is something that's clearly not and in the middle is where we argue about intent and, 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 and capturing the message or whatever. Is that, is that how you see it? I think there are, there are, to me, there are caps on either end of the spectrum of what constitutes natural wine, right? So I'm friends with some of those extraordinary purists who are like, nothing added, nothing taken away, right? Even if what happens to the wine is, you know, as Esther points out, um, is a little bit raw, right? Mm-hmm. Or frankly, is flawed, like quite in, in a more technical way of thinking, if you end up with flawed wine, that's not spoiled wine, but that's somewhere along the spectrum, there are some people who will say that is just part of it. That is what fermentation does. That is what fruit does in the field. Bacteria are unpredictable. And sometimes we come away with impure fermentations, we cut, which means we come away with wines that have unpleasant features um, that some people may not find unpleasant any longer because they are either A, accustomed to them, or B, they understand where they come from and they care so much about process and the way by which that wine, that wine came into the world that they're willing to put up with them. Um, the way that I sort of conceive of that is like, you know, if anybody has kids, it's like, look, you love the shit out of them, but like they're going to have tantrums you know? Um, and so is something wrong with the kid? Well, no, is he flawed? (laughs) Like, yeah, maybe, but aren't we all right? I think that's sort of the attitude. So I'm friends with those purists. I'm also friends with people who are like, look, you have to add a little bit of sulfur. Your wine's going to be gross. I'm also acquainted with those people who are like, I heart SO2 and put it on the t-shirt because they're like, this is an absurd conversation that we're having. Um, uh, to me, that is the spectrum (laughs) that the spectrum is you know, people's tolerance for, um, they like the, the vagrancies of fer- things like fermentation, time change, fruit, the seasons, um, and those who are not open to those, those sort of ups and downs and who would rather have a sort of a certain amount of assurance that the products that they are putting out into the world are at least regular, elegant, pure, all these other words that they might use to indicate shelf stable. Um, I don't know. So that's like a weird way of capping the capping the spectrum, but maybe that's how I maybe that's how I see it. Amanda, I feel like the reason I just I am dying just to hear more and more of your thoughts is because you are also a poet and I feel like you may may have this insight. <laughs> I, you're not supposed no one's supposed to say anything about that at all. <laughs> but I'm thinking that you may have this insight into, you know, what is beauty and is beauty imperfection and what is it about natural wine that is just so captivating because there is something captivate captivating about the lack of perfection isn't there um yes however that's not its main feature the i think where beauty and wine comes from and this is tricky because wine is both an agricultural and an aesthetic both a product and and an experience right so it is both something that we encounter and it's something that we make but it doesn't come entirely from us. It also comes from our encounter with the earth. So to me, a lot of the beauty in wine comes from this um, nexus between agriculture, culture and tradition, um, our, our scientific practices, and then the mysterious quality of things that come from planet earth that we are not in control of. Right. So like I can describe to you all day long how the chemistry of the aromatics of wine actually function. In fact, there are very brilliant chemists who do just that thing. But I cannot explain to you how sometimes when I smell 
specifically natural wines that I love, there is this sense of like all the vitality of the earth has just sort of slapped me across the face. Um, there's no chemistry for that necessarily. And that's not to say that some more conventional wines or wines with more heavier sulfur applications cannot do that also, but I have just observed over long practice with them that the wines that do it with the most vitality and the most sort of this, this nervous sense of energy that's, that's actually perceivable, you know, perceptible by the nose alone, that's something really remarkable. And it's sort of mysterious. Um, I don't know if that's beauty but it certainly feels that way to me. Um, and that, that is, is the so last time beautiful. I will say anything as woo-woo. <laughs> so I apologize for how, Not at all. You, you know. You got us convinced. Woo-woo that is. Well, I love it. I love it. Okay, so I feel like we have gotten really pumped up about natural wine. Everything Amanda said just made me love it all the more. But Martine, I, you know, I hear folks in the wine industry mouthing off about natural wine and claiming that this wine's not any good. Um, it really irks certain winemakers and critics. So maybe can you tell us their point of view? What bugs them about this style of winemaking? Before I even think of answering that, I think that a lot of people who might be irked, um, I would sometimes put myself occasionally in that category. And I can I can say why in a minute, but if you if if you listen to what Amanda just said, I don't think there's anybody who's who's obsessed with wine, who loves it, who is either in a career or an aspirational or somebody who's just enjoying wine who wouldn't agree with every word she said. And that's what's that's what's fascinating is that there is there's a lot of similarity, not a not a lot of similar, a lot of things in common, excuse me, around around that that, that poetic uh, um, idea. Um, around the, the the way that wine is crafted and the way it captures, um, you know, there's different phrases. Richard Smart, I think, says wine is uh, bottled sunshine, or somebody said that I forget, but he has it in his book, one of his books, and and she, so she 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 captured that beautifully, and so I think we would start there. Like the if you look at some of the tenants from uh, um, I think Alice's book. Uh, natural wine for the people or something like that. There's Alice firing. No, yeah. Alice. Fi yes. Alice firing. I'm not going to make a pun. <laughs> so I'm edit that out because I promised Amanda. Thank you for your restraint. Uh, at the end, I'll, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> sure. So the eight, the eight tenets of wine that she has is like uh, emotional impact and wine with life and wine with, it evolves in the glass we score wines, right? That evolve in the glass. We score, we think about balance. We think about drinkability. We think about the savoriness and we, uh, where it's just not just about fruit and all these things that I, we share in common with, with people who are champions of, of natural wine. At least for me, what it, where it starts to become, where it starts to become a little problematic to, to hear the discourse is when there is this almost, um, this polemic around around those wines that are not that don't fall in the natural camp, you know, I, I where you you equate all the rest who are not as like manufactured plonk, and when you say if a wine is crystal clear, it's been totally manipulated and stripped of life, and it's just dead, and. Sure, some of that could be some of the larger producers who have a product and who have a beverage as opposed to, um, you know, a thoughtful version of a wine might uh, be accused of of stripping, you know, all character and just having a, a clean beverage, whether it's Coke or if it's XYZ version of Sauvignon Blanc or, or Pinot Noir, right? Then I can see how that could be a target of that derision. But um, for those who are kind of in the middle, who would say, I, I make wine as honestly as I can. Uh, you know, I do use sulfur to protect against certain things that I don't want and that I do use oak and that sometimes I have to use fine or filter or all these things that are, that are uh, uh, considered manipulation by the natural wine movement. There's a strident aspect to that, to that mm. conversation that, you know, derogatory almost, you know. To be fair, the other camp gets a whole lot of derogatory sort of commentary and, and stridency put toward them as well. So it may only just be a reactionary kind of feeling, you know, 
these wines are shit. And it's like, okay, well, I I guess I'm not going to deal with the other stuff now, you know? What I think most people who don't enjoy natural wine object to about natural wine is that um, there's a lot of wine drinkers and people who work in the wine industry who really who really think like one of the fundamental things about wine is that it should not have some of these um, so-called flaws like uh, Britannomyces or oxidation or mouse, which is this very mysterious thing that can pop up sometimes in wines that don't have any added sulfur and that some people say creates the sensation of having a dead mouse in the back of your throat, which is not very pleasant. And um, it's not at all that all natural wines carry these traits, but some people, I, I mean, I just think this is the kind of basic argument against natural wine is that you should not create a, 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 a situation where it's even possible for some of these qualities to emerge in a wine. Yeah. And you know, I really, here's where I get frustrated. If we time travel back to Bordeaux, which every classical wine head on the world claims to hold as one of their great paragons, and we travel back to around the time of my great-grandparents, so we call it 1910, 1920, where some of the most extraordinary wines in those decades have ever had the fortune to taste have come from Bordeaux in those decades, zero chemical inputs, and almost no mechanical inputs, because there weren't chemicals and there were barely machines. (laughs) And all of those wines up to a certain point in all of Europe, across, you know, all of the other places where viticulture has been done were natural by default. And I bet you any money, the Bordelais weren't pumped in 1915 or 13 when they had a handful of barrels that went kind of wonky because they had a lot of volatile acidity or the ferments weren't perfect. And I bet you any money, they they probably didn't sell those barrels because they didn't taste great. But I also bet that they were willing to affirm that that is part of the process of making wine. Sometimes you lose a small piece of your harvest. That's just farming. So it it makes me irritated now that we have this, and I do think it comes from the States because we're a highly scientific people actually, especially when it comes to the things that we produce. We're like, you know, we're a Davis people and we're a Cornell people and we're a, you know, we're a, we're a scientific people and, and we want things to be precise and we want things to be as technologically advanced as possible. And I think that there's, I think there's something wrong with us. Like, I You know, like I think a problem with volatile acidity or goop to story, you know, you know, it's just shit that happens. You know, Amanda, I love I love that you cited 1910 because the the time that re- this all really changed was World Correct. War One with the chemical synthesis of nitrogen. Um, and so I there is kind of in the back of my mind all the time. I think, wow, you know, we invented modern warfare. And at the same time, we invented modern farming. And if you want to be a terrorist, a domestic terrorist, where do you go? You go to the agricultural supply store to get chemically synthesized nitrogen. So it, it is sort of it's that that period 1910 that's a very interesting time because it, it really is right before the world changed yep completely. make your bombs and make your wine all at the same store what's up <laughs> <laughs> well it's i mean that it's so interesting because i you know, I'm sure there are a lot of things we could think about the way we make food, the way we eat that um, we wouldn't want to go back to pre-industrial times about. And there's all kinds of things. I mean, even the way we make wine, there's certain technologies like that um, I don't think natural winemakers would object to using that that wouldn't have existed back then. Think about temperature control. Sure. That's like the, sta- well, the number the one steel tank, way. Or, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's so interesting, but I what I see the natural wine movement as part of a kind of larger cultural movement we've been having where we're all kind of interested in like returning to a little bit of this pre-technological, pre-industrial thing. We think about our food in this way and we're thinking of, you know, we've we've issued the like uh TV frozen dinners of previous generations and now we want food that's like freshly plucked from the earth, still with some dirt in it. We love kombucha and these kind of funky, sour, fermenty flavors. Pickles are all over our food suddenly. So to me, it's not in any way surprising if you look at our culture that natural wine would have had this inroad. Yeah. I also, I think a ton about the the eighties in Mm -hmm. in like France and a couple, I mean, countries here, 
I think, and about people being like, whoa, holy shit, what have we done? Like, I think there's a, as a panic around it. It's like, oh my God, we have to, you know, it's like back to the future. We have to go back. Um, <laughs> if only because people are starting to see like maybe the things that my parents did and my grandparents did on the land were not right. And what do we do? You know, I, I do think there's a question that's there too. So like, that's not why I love natural wine. Like, but there, but the, it is humming in the background is like, why do we eat what we eat? Why do we drink what we drink? Um, and sure, making wines that are more conventional and more careful and more beautiful and shelf stable, that's all totally understandable. But isn't there just a hair of like reticence about the loss of control and, and reticence about the lack of predictability of the world? And isn't that what a farmer's almanac was for a hundred years ago? Like, you know, when we didn't have ways to sort of make sure that everything we were producing was going to be fit as a fiddle, you know, and like, how well is it working out in certain winemaking regions anyway? Not well, (laughs) you know, like we're having to come up with new fungicides and pesticides every year to deal with the new diseases and the new pests that are in the region because they keep adapting for all of the chemical inputs that we have. So I don't know, I I don't want to sound like um, overly polemical to take Martin's word, you know, but I... I, I do think think that there's something to it. I think there's definitely something to people being like, oh my God, there's so much garbage. I, I, what do we do? <laughs> you know? You know, Amanda, you talk, you're talking in a, in a sort of broad, beautifully broad sort of generational way. And for me, I often think about, to get back to Catherine's question about what is it that irks yep. certain winemakers, many winemakers and critics and, and people who judge the style. I think uh, for the for the audience, uh, there is a... Um, there are standards that the industry has come to accept around what a Vouvray, a Chenin Blanc, should taste like from France, or what a Bordeaux should kind of taste like, right? To to, to be broadly generalistic, and uh, what some maybe some of the the audience should uh, listeners should know is that uh, whenever there is a natural wine and a, a flight of wines that is expected, that we can kind of relate to as professionals, as critics, psalms, whatever you want to call it, that it's it falls way out, not way, sometimes it falls out of bounds of what we consider uh, balanced, how we define it, the we, the, the broad we, and, and we can be villains if you want to in this case, um, and, and, and it falls out of bounds, or there is a, a, we would consider a lack of pleasure or a lack of fruit that things are obscured. Other, sorry, the, the general pleasure is obscured. But then back to your point, Amanda, is I'm thinking that if we lived, you take the trade from the 20s and take trade from the, t- the 10s and so forth, 19s, not not now, right? We would say we probably would have, if we live in that, that area, how much, of, how much of what we think of now would be different in terms of resetting the expectation of what XYZ should taste? And I, I think about that yeah. often because... I'm like, I'm sitting here, we are defining what is pleasurable, but what was pleasurable to the Romans, watered down wine or with full of herbs and spices to, to cover up the funkiness that they, they didn't know where it came from, oxygen exposure, all that stuff, is, was, was, was correct and exalted back then. I, I often think about that, but that's, I think, why the industry, broadly speaking, pushes against um, natural because most of them don't really enjoy what they think of when they think of when they when they say, when they say the word. Yeah, and I'm not no, saying no, it's right no, or wrong. No, I'm I, just I saying think, that I think that's you're absolutely right. But it, how hard is it to codify what is pleasurable? Right? Like I grew up on absolute garbage food, and mm. I go back to I return to that industrial food that I grew up on, and it doesn't taste good anymore. And I'm like, you know what? I have strong ass memories of loving McDonald's fish fillet. Like I loved that crap. And I was like, I do. I was like, that cheese was good. That fried filet was good. I, man, and I have tried to go, I love tartar sauce. I'm like, give me that. I try to go back and eat that shit. And my palate has completely changed. And I, I know I'm not the only one that's having this experience. Right. But that means that now here's what I know because I've gotten wise to it. My palate was manipulated by the industry standard for what fast food tasted like in the early 1980s. That was not my choice. That was what I was exposed to. And via exposure and repetition, we begin to have pleasurable associations with stuff that we've just been given. And I don't wonder like, okay, you know, everyone's like, oh, this thing about blind tasting. My God, does this happen to you guys where people are like, oh, you know, I don't know. It happens in restaurants all the time where there will be a group of dads and they're hanging out and they're like, listen, 
you know, have you ever seen this thing about how you put a bunch of sommeliers and wine professionals in a room and you give them the blind, the blind test and they can't tell the difference between a $500 bottle and the $5 bottle. Aren't they stupid? Isn't it weird how it's all made up? Inevitably, I'm like, the reason that people can't tell the difference is because a lot of those wines are being made in exactly the same way to hit the same corners of how a thing should taste. Like, like I'm putting that in air quotes, you know, both inexpensive wines and some very expensive wines are being made to hit the same parameters of what pleasure is in wine. And that's being set by an industry. Yeah. I'm like a little bit irritated with that because like, fuck you guys for telling me what my wine should taste like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> and I, but again, I, don't, I think the other side can be guilty of the same shit. So I, I, I think the definition of pleasure or experience of pleasure well, is, is really a slippery thing. I, I hate to cut this off, but we do need to move to our, our third topic. And we also need to take a little break for our sponsor. So we will be right back. And we have another kind of interesting element to this conversation. Are you ready, listeners, for our ERATH education series, history lesson number five? Because it is that time. And if you haven't already, please take advantage of the great price we've got on the Four Top Six Pack. That's six bottles of Erath wines selected just for the Four Top listeners and offered at an amazing price at erath.com slash the Four Top. Today, we are tasting the 2019 Oregon Pinot Gris. I have a funny story about Pinot Gris, which is once long ago in a restaurant in Montana, actually, my waiter described it was an Oregon Pinot Gris. I think it was actually Erath that I ordered. And he said, this is a beautiful, beautiful Pinot Gris. And so, which I shouldn't laugh at because if no one is required to know French just to love wine. But I want to say, this is a delicious Pinot Gris. It's not Pinot Gros. It's not Pinot Gris. It is Pinot Delicious Pinot Gris. Mm, this is a delicious wine. I want to hear what Rachel and Izzy have to say, though. So, Rachel, what do you think of this Pinot Gris? I think it's delightful. I get, like, lemon curd and honeysuckle, and I think it would be best enjoyed ice cold with a cheese plate with a couple of friends. Yum. All right, Izzy, let's hear from you. Oh, I got so excited. I was like, yes, please. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's such an easy wine to sip. I completely agree with that, and I can just imagine the beautiful cheese plate I put together with it. <laughs> and Oregon Pinot Gris, and this one, definitely, they, these wines are so food friendly. They go with just about anything. So this is really fun to taste while we are indulging in our next history lesson. I think we spoke about vineyard sites in our last lesson, and this week we're going to reflect on how far the Oregon's Willamette Valley has come since the late 1960s. It turns out that Dickie Rath and other Pinot pioneers were definitely on the right track when they braved this unknown territory to plant fine wine grapes, because in the summer of 2021, Oregon's Willamette Valley received formal protected geographical indication status from the European Union, which is such a big deal, I'm getting chills as I say that. And today, under acclaimed Senior Director of Winemaking, Gary Horner, this pioneering winery remains committed to crafting exceptional Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris that reflects the brand's rich history and the prestige of the region. Well, we are nearing the end of our special Erath Winery education series, but there's still time for you to take advantage of our exclusive offer on a six bottle set of must have Erath wines, including this delicious 2019 Oregon Pinot Gris we're tasting right now. Get your four top six pack at erath.com slash the four top to save nearly $40 on these delicious wines. And don't forget, that's us clanking glasses in the background. You can knock an additional 10% off that price if you join the Erath mailing list before you shop. Thanks, Erath Winery. We love you guys. All right, uh, there's one more aspect of this natural wine discussion we've got to get into, Esther, because I've been following some of your work, and I, I know you've covered the gray area where natural wine intersects with the clean eating movement. I know it's probably a topic that could be tackled in an entirely different show, but I just I wanted to bring it up because it's so interesting. What should consumers know about this new crop of so-called clean wines that seem to be sort of cashing in on the popularity of natural wines? 
This has been coming up a lot in my reporting, and it's it's been a fun topic and an interesting one to tackle. So I, I think we all can understand anecdotally that this, this general idea of wellness, clean eating, clean products uh, has been completely taking over our lives and um, subliminally messaging itself to us through all the media we consume probably also. So, um, you know, the just the the kind of language around wellness from what you're eating to what you're putting on your face to the cleaning products you're using. And this, this is coming from a large, very industrial, um, very sophisticated marketing uh, enterprise, right? This, this isn't about kind of artisanal uh, people creating some special little thing. I mean, we're, and I think if, if you look at the rise of things like hard seltzer and white claw, this is perfectly in line with this kind of trend we've been seeing over the last few years where people are attracted to things that seem low calorie, low impact, lower alcohol. So, um, as I've written, it's, it's just inevitable that that this would eventually kind of intersect with and actually try to capitalize on the cachet that natural wine has earned over the last several years, even though they really actually have nothing to do with each other. So um, this this reached a head last summer when Cameron Diaz, the the actress, came out with a wine brand called Aveline that markets itself as clean wine. And in her in her kind of spiel for it. She mentioned that the wine is made naturally. She used the word natural in some way and people freaking had a field day with this because as far as anyone could tell, this was like as industrial a wine as you could find. I mean, when I reached out to her people and asked, can you tell us about where the wine's from for starters? They would say only the country. They, they make, they make different wines. One is from France. One is from Spain. They won't give you an appellation, meaning a specific region. They won't tell you anything about the farming, the inputs. I mean, this is just a kind of anonymous wine mass produced that gets Cameron Diaz's name slapped on it and calls itself clean wine. And what does it even mean? Nobody knows. I mean, is it that it's lower in alcohol? We don't know what kinds of processes might might qualify it as a clean wine because we don't really know much about how it was made. And um, it's, you know, the people who who really love natural wine love it not only for the kind of perceived health aspects, which we might talk about, but they love it more for the reasons I think that Amanda has been expressing that it's, it's actually somehow a kind of art. It's beautiful. There's something alive yeah. about it. It's small. It's, I mean, it's small batch by definition, like this is kind of handmade, low production artisanal wine. You can't mass produce it. Right. So, um, you know, I don't think, I, I think it was only a matter of time before we, we encountered this type of thing and it's, it's fully happening. And now I think we're in a moment and I think this is what has, what has really catalyzed some of the, like the French natural wine definition, you know, it's a moment of reckoning. How does natural wine kind of protect itself yeah. without, you know, does it want to enter into the bureaucracy like the French natural wine definition invites? Um, or does it risk getting kind of trampled over and the the big marketers coming in and taking the hard, honest work that they've done over the last several years and running with it? You know, the irony is that natural wine making as winemakers as a, as a group might say, we're not clean yeah 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 <laughs> and like great yeah. point great point and well would, i mean when you say that yeah right yes and no some of them work so damn clean you could eat off their floors you know like their cellars are pristine oh, well, like yeah. you're like damn i don't like clean my own bathtub like this like this is remarkable you know, I think what's funny about it is that like, bro, it's still alcohol. Like if what your problem was, was that you were trying to eat clean, like you just got to cut that shit out. Like, <laughs> you know, there's no, 
There's no <laughs> amount of totally, like, totally. No amount of reverse osmosis in the world is going to keep you from turning that shit from carbohydrates into sugar into fat on your body. That's how it works. So, like, best of luck, Cameron, because I don't know what you're after. <laughs> I really don't. I know. Well. But there has been this trend with supermodels holding up their natural wine, and there's some sort of idea that it makes them slimmer, healthier. And, it's so uh, dumb. All right, uh, forget me. I'm gonna I'm gonna pop off on this. Halle, Halle Berry did it too. You gotta stop. Look, this this shit. Okay, you drink natural wine because it tastes awesome. Okay, and it smells lovely. And even when it doesn't smell lovely, at least you know that a little bit about how it was made. We're talking about native yeast. We're talking about natural ferment. We're talking about avoiding finding and filtering if you can. We're talking about lower levels of sulfur dioxide. I'm talking about actual real practices, right? I am not talking about you staying skinny or you having less of a hangover or you like doing better <laughs> self-care or whatever dumb idea is being wafted around. No, I'm talking about if you're going to drink, drink better. If we're going to ferment, ferment the real way. Like if, you know, or whatever, like I'm obviously drinking a beer that's slightly more mass produced, right? But like, if we're going to do these things, let's at least learn a little bit about how they get here. And it's definitely not going to keep you skinny. Just like, leave it, leave that at the door. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd compare it to like, um, some kind of totally fat free ice cream dairy product <laughs> sure. Uh, sure. that, you know, kind of has everything zapped out of it as opposed to some full fat, full cream, but like, you know, you know, the woman who made it and you know, which cow of hers produced yeah. the milk for it. Yeah. You know, the cow's name. Yeah. But, and so you're not like the idea is not to be skinny. Yeah. Anyway. I know it just it, it like links together so quickly with that <laughs> with that dumb stuff. Um, so now I hate to wind down this discussion. I feel like I could speak with you all for hours about this, but it is time to move on to our dessert wine course, if you'd like to call it that. Um, and this is the part of the show where we each share something we've just been enjoying this week that has something to do with food and beverage. So um, just it could be anything that you've been enjoying. I just want to let everyone know about the mystery series I just finished. It's by an author named Dolores Redondo, and she is, writes about uh, mysteries in Basque country. And she used to be a culinary student before she studied law and then became a mystery writer. So her food descriptions are excellent um so if you're looking for a good new mystery series check out dolores redondo um so did anyone else bring something to share this week or something to recommend well you know i uh i'm oh i'm a huge fan as is my six-year-old daughter of the uh, the the, the pan au chocolat tradition in france and in honor of of uh my uh uh uh, my my friendship with Esther that started right before the pandemic, and then we ended up uh, never uh, saying hello for a couple of years now. There is a, a, a place in San Francisco, Arsico, that uh, makes freshly baked uh, 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 croissant. Sorry, croissants if we're not whatever. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm a you know their the chocolat are is are are um, through the roof ridiculously incredible and i would love to one day just have some sort of instant time machine that can go from like that have the, a, a fresh uh croissant or pain au chocolat and do taste it next to one from france because it's off the hook it's <laughs> legit sounds amazing it, he's not he's not lying they're really good and i'm so happy you've you've discovered them they're it's on our guello <laughs> In the Richmond district in San Francisco, and there's always a very long line outside, but it's worth waiting in. We'll have to put that on our social feed. Um, Esther, do you have a dessert item to share with us? Dessert wine item? Well, yes, and it's not dessert. It's not dessert, but it it's something I I acquired just really the block the next block over from Arsico. So I I live near this fabulous um, Spanish specialty food store called the Spanish table. There's one in San Francisco. There's also a location in Berkeley. Yeah. And I've become completely addicted to their imported Spanish bocarones, little white anchovies that are marinated in vinegar. The mm -hmm. brand I always buy is called Ortiz. And um, they're, so they're truly, I, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think they're 
probably the platonic ideal of a natural wine pairing. They would just <laughs> go great with some salty, racy, you know, slightly cloudy white wine. And um, I make Caesar salads with them. I eat them on crackers. I just eat them whole. They're so, so, so good. Mm, yum. And Amanda, what what can you share with us this week that you've been enjoying? Well, the things that I uh, typically enjoy on a week to week basis are usually what's open in the low boy at the end of service in our restaurants. So <laughs> the things that I've been drinking for shift drink over the last week, um, I would say if I'm pouring out of a glass or two of wine, I've been drinking multiple bottles of Jochen Bjorer, who is this really great natural winemaker in, in uh, Württemberg in Southern Germany. He made an electric, electric rosé this year. Um, that's a blend of both, um, French, German, and actually Alpine Italian, um, varieties. And it's, it's not expensive. It's biodynamically farmed. It's just like lightning in a bottle. It's so delicious. So I would recommend, um, and I've also been drinking a ton of the beers from, Mm. um, Arrowwood Brewery, which is a really lovely, um, quite natural brewery up in the Hudson Valley, uh, in the Catskills in New York. And they make totally beautiful wild ales that they actually can, which not a lot of people do who make wild ale. They've got one called porch beer that I think I've had like 75 of in the last week. So if you can find Arrowwood, you should drink them. (laughs) We will dig these up and put them on our social media feed as well. Thanks for all the recommendations, everyone. Got me thirsty and hungry. (laughs) Amanda Smelt's a poet. I know I'm not supposed to say that, but you are. And also the wine director for the Estello and Ultra Paradiso restaurants in New York City. Uh, Esther Mobley, the wine columnist at the San Francisco Chronicle. And of course, our co-host, Martin Reyes, MW, whom you can read all about at ReyesWineGroup.com. I'm Catherine Cole here in the high fiber protein packed city of Portland, Oregon, in my kids' closet. Um, it's been such a pleasure recording with you all. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in. Uh, we do want to hear what you think about the natural wine debate. So please visit thefortop.org where you can find our social media handles. You can tweet at us, send us an Instagram message. Please don't spam us. And please subscribe to The Four Top on your favorite podcast app and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts so others can find the show. Bye bye now. This has been the Four Top Podcast. Catherine Cole is our executive producer. Izzy Kramer is our senior producer. And I'm Keelan King, sound supervisor. We are also assisted by audio editor, Michelle Richards, our production assistant, Rachel Grossman, and our social media assistants, Lex Rule and Nick Tool. Please visit our website, thefortop.org, to learn more about us, listen to back episodes, reach out to us on social media, and purchase books written by our amazing panelists. And if you have not already subscribed to The Four Top on iTunes, NPR One, or Spotify, please do so and leave us a rating. Stay safe out there, and thanks for listening. Oh, wait a minute. Are, are you still there? Oh, well, if you're still listening, then I need to tell you something. I need to tell you about the fabulous swag over at sparklingwineanytime.com. Sparkling Wine Anytime is, of course, your favorite new book about all things bubbly, but it is also a wonderful website designed by our team, Lex and Rachel. And we have gifts and goodies galore for you. We have sparkling wine themed beach towels, teas, cocktail napkins, fancy wine flasks, adorable tote bags, and more. And guess what? Your purchase will help to support a favorite cause of ours, Aivoy, that's A-H-I-V-O-Y, check it out, which provides education and career training to vineyard stewards in the Willamette Valley. So it's a win-win for everyone. And who doesn't love sparkling wine anytime? Please head to sparklingwineanytime.com we would love to see you there. Thanks. We love you all. You're wonderful. Kiss, kiss.